Do you know that a little better? Go ahead. All right. I'm Emily Shattuck. I'm a guide in the Spanish dual language children's house. I work with um, Karen. And um, this is my 20th year here. I've, um, I love it. My children went to school here and they've uh, gone, went all the way through from the time they were toddlers through the whole program through eighth grade. And um, yeah, I'm just happy to share some of the materials with you and just give you a taste of why three years in children's house is so valuable. And then of course, I'm a proponent for beyond children's house going all the way through, but. Um, you all have stayed here, both of your children stay here? Yes, all the, all the way through, yeah. I'm Lydia Farmer, children's house guide. I've been here for six years, but in Montessori children's house classrooms for 11 years. Both of my children will have gone here. Um, my son Cody is in Emily's classroom, and my younger son Desmond will start in January, when the moment he turns 18 months. So we are um, we're here to talk to you about the three years of Children's House. Um, last year we did this talk, and we used language as the thread to just observe what happens over those three years. And this year we're going to look at math as the trajectory over the three years. So a lot of our work here is just giving them the best foundation we can. Um, a lot of it is responsibility and moving out of the way so they can be independent, which is so hard to sit on our hands and struggle a little bit mm -hmm. as they learn. So we wanted to start with just um, a video that gives a little bit of an overview of the kinds of things that we want to talk about that has real footage from the classroom because as much as we can talk about it, it's really helpful to just have in your mind the real experience that takes place in the classroom.
household community as well. Instead of just sitting at a table waiting to be served, how can the child feel as if he or she is preparing himself something or contributing in some really meaningful way? A lot of families tell me that their child is in charge of feeding the dog or something like that, and you can't underestimate how important those skills are in preparation for academic work. Question. Yeah. yeah. If your child has that responsibility of having to feed the dog, mm -hmm. doing something else, and the child gives resistance and just doesn't want to do it, the dog still has to get fed. Oh, yeah. Do you bulldoze and just, I mean, I say bulldoze, but do you just say, if you're not going to do it, then I'm going to do it, and then you do it with the child, or do you wait around and give that child the space and the time to do it? You see my conflict and the dinner has to get on the table well, and have to sit down and like there's a timeline about this whole thing. It's not that the child has to feed the dog. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not like an angry situation. No. I mean I, I can't imagine a child not wanting to do yeah. it. And if the child doesn't feel like doing it at that moment, then you're gonna do it. Yeah. I mean, the child wants to do what the child sees you doing. Right. So it's not yeah. like a and fight. It's kind of like Instead of fighting about eating vegetables, you just savor that delicious kale. My like, gosh, it's so delicious. My child didn't eat the kale, but I got to enjoy it, and maybe next time, right? I mean, I wouldn't worry about it. But we don't want to overstep and tell you this is what you should be doing at home. If it's not working, then you can say thanks for the advice. <laughs> That's not working for me. But how could it work? How has there been a way that your child has felt so important in your household? How has it worked? What you were talking about, please. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the things I know that physicians do is if it's about feeling like about cleaning up. Mm -hmm. So you clean up while I don't. So what, one thing I learned is like let's do it together. So I, I just felt when I started it with her, you know, like she, she's more engaged to do it. Yeah. Most of the time I had a job, but at least she's participating in it. Exactly. Her yeah, experience is that she yeah. feels important and needed and yeah. useful and working together. Who likes to be told to do something? I mean, you don't tell your partner, it's time to feed the dog now. I mean, that doesn't feel good to hear as an adult. It doesn't feel good to hear as a child either. So doing it together is a really great way of just feeling comfortable. And of course, it's not like, hey, it's time for you to prepare our snack. No. Hey, could you help me with something? Um, let's see, what should we have? So the child feels that they're choosing to do it themselves. They're not feeling that they're being told to do something. That's a responsibility that doesn't feel good. Um, a lot of times, like my child doesn't want to help prepare dinner. And if I've decided that tonight he is going to help me prepare dinner, <laughs> I've decided that. And I'll say, Cody, would you like to peel the carrots or do you want to trim the green beans? It's it's up to you. And of course, by the time he's in it, he's going to love it and he's going right. to enjoy it. But another night, I might just say, do you want to help me prepare dinner tonight or do you feel like playing? And he gets to pick and I don't care. But you get to choose ahead of time what you want to expect. So in that first year, once they're feeling emotionally, all their emotional needs are met and then they're starting to choose work and um, building a work cycle. And a work <coughs> cycle is the initiative to think, okay, what do I want to work with right now? Make that choice, take that work to a table or rug, work with it um, to fulfill some inner drive, you know, to completion or meet and fulfill that need, and then clean it up, return it to the shelf, roll up the rug, um, clean up the area, and then move on to another work choice, or going to have snack, or going to you know work outside. So that work cycle um, is starting to build in that first year. Um, as they engage with the materials, they're also lengthening their concept concentration, something like scrubbing a table is always the pinnacle of like, <laughs> can a child <coughs> scrub a table from 
start to finish. It's a lesson when you write it up. It has nearly 50 steps and um, several trips back and forth to the sink, you know, carrying a bucket or carrying a pitcher of water and remembering uh, what comes next. And then when it's done, oh, I need to hang up these towels because they've they're damp now and I need to go get another towel. So it's a lot of movement <laughs> back and forth and so many steps and the, the ability to remember those steps and those sequences are the foundation for later academic work. Um, and then the ability to work without an adult always with them is huge. So many children come in and used to always having an adult by their side, and we cannot do that when I mean, we have 25 children in our class and two adults, and that is intentional so that they have to learn to build confidence and independence to work alone, or also to learn that other children can help other children. You don't always need to rely on adults, and that they can help others. <coughs> They build that confidence because oh, I can I can zip my coat now. Now I can help zip other children's coats, and I mean the joy they get from helping another person. You know <coughs> how satisfying that is to be able to use your skills to help someone else. Yeah, that's amazing. So that's that's what the first years you know planting that seed so they can get to the um, academic work. And we're going to show some of the um, foundational um, lessons in that first year. So does anybody want to be a child to do a lesson? Are you interested in doing that? Let's start with the red box. Let's start with the geometric half deck. Okay. Because I, I, I would yeah. do that before I would get to the red box. Okay. Um, you can say yes or no, you don't have to mm -hmm. get down on the floor. Is anyone interested in doing it or do you want me to just show? Yeah? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, we, I want to show um, something that might look very, very simple. The first time a child would do this, I'm going to give, like, you've had a few lessons first. Okay, today. And then, and then I'm going to invite you to another lesson that we'll actually do. So, this is um, the first drawer of the geometric cabinet. Um, all different types of geometric shapes are in here, and this is just all different sizes of circles. Um, a lot of what the child is doing with this work is tracing the outside of it, feeling a sensory information that is connecting their hand to their brain um, and their eye, and really preparing for all type of handwriting in the future. Um, but the lesson that I wanted to show is They've spent some time just tracing the shapes, putting them back in. They've even matched to these cards here. And now we're gonna do something really exciting. Are you ready? For this work, we're gonna need another rug. And we're gonna take these cards. A great distance away. We're gonna play a distance game. So, can you please take these cards way over this outer rug on the other side of the room. And in the classroom, it may be all the way. All you know, the far side of the corner room. away. <laughs> Yeah, 
had the experience. <laughs> How awesome is that, that that is that challenging? You're holding that shape in your mind across the room, and you, right, you even had the instinct to look, is it the same? <laughs> holding an idea so precise in your mind is actually really challenging, and it's really an important skill, because everything that we're doing, um, especially in the math curriculum, is, a, is about going from concrete thinking to abstract thinking. And everything that Montessori wrote about the child's mathematical mind is about being able to conceive of ideas in your mind, being able to imagine what will happen next, being able to hold the idea of five of something in your mind. All of that is really abstract thinking. So before we ask them to hold the idea of five of something, we're going to ask them to hold the idea of this size of something, or this exact um, like a equilateral triangle instead of a scalene triangle, right? We all the different drawers in the geometric cabinet are going to be different shapes, but circles is just the first one. So thank you so much for doing that lesson, going out of your thank comfort you. zone. That was <laughs> really exciting. We did put this away. So. Sorry, just a question. Is that really what they're doing is holding the image in their mind? Because like when I was doing it, I, I'm just saying, oh, it's the second smallest That's one. That's what I do. You can do and, that and too. And I yeah. come over and say, okay, which one's the second smallest? Right, but these are random. Exactly. And they could both be randomized, and you could think to yourself, it's the second smallest. Um, when we do it with the knob cylinders, for example, there are going to be 10. So you could, to be able to think, okay, that's the fifth smallest is a little more challenging than the second smallest. And I'll even acknowledge that exact thing and say, <coughs> um, this is the second smallest one. If it's really too hard for them, this is only six. But then if you're doing like the, gym, the knob cylinders, having 10 of them, it's a little more challenging to remember where in the sequence, especially if they they're all random ordinal numbers. Yeah, they may not have an idea. That is a more yeah, of an adult yeah. way of thinking. Yeah, that's an adult it. way of thinking. Or maybe they're just guessing. And then the learning that's taking place is, oh, okay, it's a little bit too big. Mm -hmm. Now the skill even of carrying it back and being like, which one should I get now? Um, should I get the one that's a little bit bigger? Or should I get the one that's a little bit smaller? Mm -hmm. To correct the mistake is probably the most significant work that's being done there. Also in that first year, um, <coughs> they were working a lot with the, um, to discriminate size with the pink tower and the brown stair and the knobbed cylinders mm -hmm. and there's knobless cylinders so they're discriminating and comparing constantly so they're developing a mathematical mind to compare and contrast and the red rods, I mean, some first ch children get to it definitely in the beginning of the second year, they should be working here. And this um, is a lot more challenging for a young child than we would expect. They're called upon to sequence these rods from the longest to the shortest. Um, and it's hard for them. It is really difficult. I remember when Leo did this, it was like a big day. <laughs> it was a big, it was like a lot of build up to it. Um, you know, he had to do a lot of work before getting to this. Mm -hmm. And one of his, you know, um, a third year did it with him. Mm -hmm. At least the first time, he did it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, and it was like, yeah, it's such a big deal. Right. So these red 
rods and all the materials are on the shelf. So to first get a rod and then carry each red rod carefully to the rug or each cube from the pink tower or each rectangular prism from the brown stair. Um, they're feeling, feeling each dimension. You know, with the pink tower, it's um, one centimeter cube to 100 centimeters cube which is going to be the foundation later for the squaring and cubing work. You know, it's the same dimensions, which is so neat. And they're feeling the tenness of it, you know, of that base 10 decimal system. Um, and here, so this is 10 centimeters, and the longest is 100 centimeters. And for them to sequence them from the longest to the shortest, and as we're calling upon the child to do that. They're showing, I mean, they're carrying it. They can feel the length, right? This is isolating the length of long and short. And then also we're, we're just running our hands over each rod and then aligning it so there's precision. Um, and tell me your story yeah. about what your picture is there of the child in your class. She, so you can see there's that one long rod down there, right? And so what was she, she doing had there? Aligned, this was her first <coughs> experience trying to use this, and she had aligned them all, as you see, perfectly, except for this one. <laughs> and, I, and, and it was built up like a stair. And we looked at it together, and I just said, hmm. And she was like, hmm. <laughs> like, nothing wrong with this, right? And, and I just pulled these ones down to see what would happen if she could see what would align them by length. And it wasn't until that moment that I had pulled them down that she was even able to see that one that was way longer. Um, and she was able to correct it. But it's, it's very interesting how it looked so obvious to an adult mm -hmm. and to a child. It was just... So we have an interesting relationship with this, the red with this work. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell us. So my son has no interest in this particular work, um, but at Take Your Parent to School Night, he picked that up off the shelf, which he had not had a lesson on, and aligned it perfectly himself. Like, what do you, and I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. have you worked with the red rods? No, I don't want to work with the red rods. He does mm -hmm. not want to approach this. But somehow he has that, like he mm -hmm. can visually discriminate. Yeah, but he does not. But he does. It's it. just not the red ones. That's interesting, and it's and in his and he had class, not had a lesson in either. But right. he sort of understood what the expectation was from seeing it on the shelf. You know, right? Line up a certain way. Huh. Kids, for you guys saw the bigger. Kids. Well, no, they there are no bigger kids in his class. Oh, oh. It's, See, <laughs> that's tricky because if I have my first inclination would be. Oh, I would just have an older child do the red rods with him, yeah. you know, because sometimes they don't want it from the adult, but if they really... Um, but a child knows he wants to make his own choice. Yeah. He doesn't want to do the thing that someone wants him to do. No, he, he wants to do the thing that he wants to do. So he's going to know how to find the thing that's his choice that nobody told him to do. That's my gut. Mm -hmm. But then th this is the preliminary step to get to that. Just to make sure visually they can discriminate because we want them to be successful when they move on to the number rods because if they can't visually discriminate this, they're not going to be able to be successful mm -hmm. with that yet. This is what we've been struggling with because he's like, I want that, I don't mm -hmm. want this. Right. And we want them to be successful mm -hmm. and know they're ready. Yeah, but you can see the connection, obviously, between mm -hmm. the materials are exactly the same. They're identical. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that now with the number of rods, when they get into that, when they're four years old or in their second year, um, they can practice their one-to-one -one correspondence. And it's, um, I'm always having to tell myself not to want to rush and get to the number of rods yeah. and the number symbols because the sensorial materials are so rich. All that geometric cabinet and all the nomenclature for all those geometric shapes and the geometric solids. And then 
I mean, later that builds, once they have the, those foundations and the, the sensory image for those shapes, and then they can use the triangles in the constructive triangle boxes to make different shapes. It's such a gift, I know, for my children when they went on to higher level math and <coughs> geometry and algebra. They, it was just like no problem for them. I think because they had this sensory image and familiarity with all of it in their heads and they could access that when it got abstract. Did that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, because a child who's three can probably count rope by rope. Mm -hmm. So you would think, why can't they just count the number rods? And they probably could, right? Mm -hmm. But the whole purpose of us even having a sensorial curriculum in the first year is to build that foundation that's, you're not just preparing them to count the number rods. Like Emily is saying, you're, you're preparing them for high school. Call it. I mean, you really yeah. are giving them sensory impressions. It's a gift. Yeah. And they want to touch things mm -hmm. and at this stage, and they can just absorb it. So between three to six is that's what Montessori is called the absorbent mind. It's so much easier for them to absorb that information at this time in their lives. Corey. And so this would be in first year or second year? Um Sometimes the end of the first year, you know, if a child is really quick and visually and able to, has the concentration, has the work cycle, has been working with the sensorial materials, and you can see that they can visually discriminate and they're careful with the materials, maybe it's, maybe they're getting into the first year. Definitely the second year, you want them to be successful with this, and if they're not, you're thinking, hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what's nice about these materials too, because if it's not coming easily, then we get that input and, and it's telling us what are, what's happening visually that they're not seeing this discrimination. Like, how can we help? Yeah. Yes. In the office, skills are kind of on the foundation. So, do you find that we complement those skills at home, or should we like work on?
Just one last question about yeah. the first share is, yeah. um, not that this relates to my own child, but <laughs> if you have an only child and he only has adults in his life, his stepbrothers are adults, 29 and 27, right. he's got his father, he's got his mom, he's got his grandparents, but he sees adults all the time. He is not, while he's comfortably socially, he has told the teachers and made it clear, I don't want lessons from other kids. Like, the teacher's the authority. I want her to give he's me get, lessons. He's getting He's getting better? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, how do you make that change in the classroom, though? Do you just keep engaging the kids they think yes. they like? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So if he says she's the cool kid, then he'll just bring her in to show him something? And eventually you put out, like, work that they cannot resist. And usually it has to do with food. <laughs> <laughs> and then... <laughs> Make it irresistible. Yes, make it irresistible. That's right. And then you can show the child. Okay. That's good. I actually have one more question. Yeah. Sort of relating back to this peculiar situation. So do you ever have a child who, like, just gets stuck because the preliminary stuff doesn't interest them and they're not Definitely. quite ready yeah. for it? And then it's nice because there's other ways to visually discriminate. There's other materials. There's novelist cylinders, too. And... Um, do you just find a workaround so that they get Yeah, just more practice visually discriminating. Or more, more games. We, we can do this at a distance, too, with two rugs. Um, playing, diff you know, coming in <laughs> different ways until it clicks. And then it does. Mm -hmm. But you're asking, like, do you force them to do the red rods when there's no interest? Is that what you're or like, asking? Like, what's the bridge, you know, between what the child is interested in if it's not that that preliminary step that typically would, you know, precede the blue rods, for example. I usually say, oh my gosh, I know you just cannot wait to get to those number rods. <laughs> Let me show you some work to get ready for those. And then I'd be getting out the novelist cylinders. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yes, work around. <laughs> All right. All right. So in their second year, they're coming back and it's so nice because their guide is familiar, their space is familiar, um, and, and they're some of the older children. So um, it's nice too when they come back how our, the first few days are school, um, we have a day when just the older children come back. So we can really give them a pep talk and say, oh my I'm going to need her help this year. We have so many new children. And who thinks they can help me? Because, you know, and they all want to help. Um, they're all slowly becoming leaders. Um, and so they're, it's so, and it's so sweet to watch, you know, helping the new little ones who can't put on their shoes or their slippers. And the ones, they were just there last year. They were the ones that couldn't do it. And now they're helping them. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to behold, yeah, that, that community and how they take the young ones under their wing. Yeah. The second years are just incredible. I, I'm feeling so much pride for them this year. Little jobs like, Leo, can you, would you mind going to get the first aid kit for us? Well, you know, jobs that are so important. Mm -hmm they're capable of, and I know I can trust them to go and do something important. They're aware of this feeling too. They're aware that they can be a resource, they can be a model for the younger ones, and they're also starting to be aware of this big work. That all of a sudden now, they are starting to make that leap that I'm going to be able to do this. Even if they're not doing it today, they're starting to really see that they are going to do it soon. So you start to get into conversations about sequence of work on the shelves. And they start to say, I, I want to do that. And you say, I can't wait. Let's practice this and make sure that we're ready for it. So they're starting to really see themselves as the big kids. I had a mom tell me that her daughter said to her in the car, she was sort of, I don't know, your children sometimes will just go into this 
talking through their day or talking through what they just did or something. And she was talking to herself in the back seat of the car and she said, oh, am I a third year? Because she was thinking to herself about the work that she was doing, but that's what's happening to them is they're starting to think that they are really capable now. They're starting to do really big work. I had to leave my name out on a work because I didn't get to finish it and I'm going to leave it out for tomorrow. I mean, these kinds of things, they want to see the size of the work that they're doing. Um, so we call it a period of academic rigor because it truly is. These second years have to make sure they know all of their sounds, all their phonogram sounds. They're starting to get deep into the academic work. Um, it's very motivating, very motivating to see the sequence and the scope of the lessons that are in front of them and to see their place in that sequence and to see that they're making progress through it. You were just using that word about importance. This is important. This is important. Like an emphasizing it. Yeah, I'm hearing that. I didn't realize how much I was hearing it until you said the word. And it does come in fits and starts. It's not a continuous graph, you know, line. It's very much like this week was a gigantic progress and then it is a leveling off. It's definitely an inconsistent growth. Yeah, it's just life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we'll show some lessons from the second year. So, who wants to do the number rods? <laughs> <laughs> no, she wants to get to the next thing. <laughs> so, in um, both in math and in language, we we want to introduce the the concrete thing separately from the symbol of the thing. So this math lesson is going to be only using the number rods and no symbols, and it's going to give us a real understanding of how much the child is able to have an understanding of the meaning of one, or the meaning of five, or the meaning of ten. No symbols here to distract from the, the actual quantities. quantity. Right, so I'm describing the difference between the quantity and the symbol. We do introduce the symbols as well, but separate from the quantities. First we will introduce the quantity, then we will introduce the symbol, and after both of those are extremely well internalized, we will associate the two. So this is just about quantity. Does anybody want to do the number rods? Who would like to do the number rods today? Okay. Okay. Now, now we Nicole, I want to play a game with the number rods today. Do you want to make it, do you want to think of a number or do you want me to think of a number? You think of a number. I'll think of a number, okay. I, we're just going to, yeah, sure. I'll be over here five. Yeah. Okay. So, Nicole, come over here. You unroll this rug and... I'm thinking of a number. What'd you bring? One. You brought one? Show me. Prove it. Prove that this is one. You got it on your first guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I have to make this harder. One, two, 
three, four, five. Five, it is five, you got five. Oh my gosh, I need to make it really hard. Can you find?
called the mystery number game, where there's a little basket of folded up numbers, zero through 10, and they have to um, choose a number out of the basket, peek at it, they don't tell anybody, hold that number in their head, slide a little slip of paper under the rug, and then say, do you know your number? Okay, go get that many pencils. Go get that many sandpaper letters. Go get that many flowers from flower arranging work. And we can have a group of children playing this game. So they have to recognize the symbol, hold it in their head, know what the quantity is, bring it back, and then we all try to guess each other's number, mystery number. So that's almost like a little test, even though we don't have tests, but just to make sure they really know the symbols and the quantities. And once they have a strong understanding of that, we move on to the decimal system materials and the golden beads, which are my favorite Montessori material <laughs> ever. Um, so the first lesson. <coughs> I just want to ask a question. You yeah. said zero to 10. How do you teach zero? Oh, zero, we have a um, work called the spindle boxes. Oh, wait, we don't have them here, but they're. Um, boxes with the symbol zero through nine, and there's little compartments, and then a box of wooden spindles. And there's 55 spindles in the box and these empty compartments. And um, first we're, we check and see if they know the symbols. <coughs> and then we, they know they work with zero with the sandpaper numbers. But then this lesson really introduces that zero, we don't give anything to zero. Zero means nothing. Zero means nothing. And then it's the first lesson. These are all ent single entities. That's a single entity mm -hmm. that represents 10, and that's a single entity that represents 1. But the spindles are all separate entities. So we, cre we introduce the concept of bundling single entities to create a quantity. To get so they sets. To get a set. Yeah. Right. So the first. Like holding zero in your hand feels like this, versus holding nine in your hand feels like, you know, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. All uh, right. So then the golden beads. Um, so I'll say, Tori, you know, you're ready for the golden beads. Um, this is one unit. What did I put in your hand? One bead. And, and call it one unit. One unit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you give me one unit? You're right. What did you give me? One unit. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so there's lots of units all together here. Do you see all those units? Okay. I'm going to count them. There's one unit, two units, three units, four units, five units, six units, seven units, eight units, nine units, ten units. Can you open your hand, Corey? This is 110. What's in your hand? 10 units. Yeah, we can call it 110. 110. Yeah. Thank you. I have 110. There are lots of 10s all together here. I'm going to count all the 10s. 110, 2 10s, 3 10s, 4 10s, 5 10s, 6 10s, 7 10s, 8 10s, 9 10s, 10 10s. Ten tens is 100. Can you put out your hand so I can put 100 in your hand? What is in your hand? Ten tens. And we call that 100. You're right. Ten tens is 100. You are right. There are, see all these hundreds all together? Let's see, I love counting. There's <laughs> One hundred, two hundreds, three hundreds, four hundreds, five hundreds, six hundreds, seven hundreds, eight hundreds, nine hundreds, ten hundreds. Ten hundreds is one thousand. Are you ready to hold one thousand? Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> one thousand. What are you holding? A thousand. Yes, one thousand. And then I'd go again. This is one unit. This is one ten. This is 100. This is 1,000. Can you pick up 100? Can you put 100 here? And we do that second period lesson until they're ready to say, this is 100. This is one unit. This is 1,000. Just the impression they're getting of 1,000, of 100, of a 10, of a unit. And there's a, then we'll introduce the symbol. 
for 1 unit, 110, 100, 1,000. And then laying out nine units. We have a tray with nine units, nine tens, nine hundreds, and a thousand. And practicing, can you bring me four hundreds? Can you bring me <coughs> seven tens? Can you bring me five hundreds, two tens? Can you bring me one thousand, three hundreds, seven tens, two units? So they're making quantities and then also they're learning the symbols and then associating the symbols and the quantities. Um, and then they're ready for the bank game. This is all in the second year? Yeah. Yes, it's all in the second year. Um, mm -hmm. So the bank game, oh, I need my other little cup. So who wants to play? We can, we can have two people play the bank game, but two people want to play. <laughs> <laughs> sum of seven units. All right, Meredith, Ingrid has six tens, and you have five tens. Can you put all the tens together, please? Eleven tens. Okay. Now remember, the other day, you had a lesson. When you count, you always stop when you get to ten. Can you count, um, did you get to ten tens? I remember you were going to add <coughs> 10 tens to the bank. What's 10 tens the same as? 100. Yeah. So you're going to take the 10 tens. Let's pretend this is our bank over here. And you're going to exchange for 100 because you know 10 tens is the same as 100. Right? Yes. So you can put your 100 here with the other 100s. And how many tens are still here for your son? One. Yep. So, yep. All right, Ingrid, you have 400s, and Meredith has 400s, and there's one more 100 that was exchanged at the bank. Can you put all the 100s together? Can you count some how many there are? <laughs> I mean, usually the 
children are moving around getting the decimal prices because <laughs> we're old. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hey, I'm four. Are you married? You can keep all the thousands together. Ingrid has two thousands and you have three thousands. One, two, three, four, five thousands. <laughs> practice more, we practice reading addition problems. Um, before this, they would have had also a lesson in how to exchange and knowing that when they have 10 units, they need to exchange for a 10 and then to, for the next, exchanging for the next place value. Thinking about observing in lower L and they're just like exchanging like mm -hmm. crazy and <laughs> doing these big problems together. So that Oh, yeah. And then in third year, they can do currency exchange for the rate associated with the rate. Because it's an app one. That could be good lower L work. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Um, <laughs> but Emily shared the story. They are yeah. telling the story of what they did, and it's a narrative. Mm -hmm. And that experience that they had with addition is so memorable. Mm -hmm. And reading it, reading the story, writing the story down so that you could share it with your family mm -hmm. is, is a little bit one step further. Mm -hmm. That's one what I was saying to lower L's. There were mm -hmm. probably first years in lower L's doing a lot of the writing and making up their own problems together in a group and working independently and using the bank to figure it out. Do you send paper numbers as well? They later, when they're writing, will write numbers. Oh, yes, we do. Yeah. 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 And yeah. they have the choice. Sometimes they say, would you like to write it down? And, and they often do want to write down their addition problem. And that will later do multiplication with the banking and division and subtraction. Um, so it's all very concrete. And they're, again, getting that impression of what is addition? You know, what is multiplication and sharing? Imagine that would make you want to do really big yes. problems because I would want like, a big tower. <laughs> you know, like you want to see, see the big stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's really about the experience at this stage. It's really about carrying that heavy tray. <gasps> My number has so many thousands, I had to go back twice <laughs> to carry them all because there were so many. And, and the youngers one, watch one of the oldest. Oh, ones. yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leo's been saying for like weeks now, I've been working on the hundreds. Is, is this is what, is this what, uh, what he's he's talking about. Very close. Yeah, okay. Very, so is he, close. so it's more like he's watching the bigger he's kids. Watching. Well, yeah. um, he's getting very close. 
he's building the length of focus that's needed to be able to do the whole thing on his own. And for a while there, he was saying, oh, it was challenging, very challenging. But like the last week, he's been saying, it's been fun. Like, it's fun. Yeah. That's All right. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but I have no idea what he's talking about. So now I <laughs> 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 He's been experiencing this a lot. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK, second year, so much. Sorry, so Emily, you see you're in the dual language. So when they were doing this the first time, second time, would, would sometimes it be in Spanish, or is that mixing concepts too much? Um, so once a child knows the number rods and the number symbols in Spanish, I'll have Senora Karen go back and give that lesson again in Spanish. Did I say English or Spanish the first time? Spanish. They, the first I do English, and then once they have that concept in English, then Karen will go back and represent it in Spanish. Um, she'll also do this, you know, once they know this, then a new, cien, um, and yes, yes, and so she'll go back and do this in Spanish. Um, she's not really doing that so much in Spanish just because she's not Montessori trained and usually I'm doing the bank game with him, but she'll, she's also doing the teens and up through 100, just the counting and the names of numbers in Spanish, but not so much this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're also doing a lot more in the math group than we're just showing you. Yeah. Piece and of the children, it. too, like the Spanish might be more like a rote counting work for them. And like you would see the one, ten, and seven units, you know, a child is going to be able to count through 17. They might have even done the teen speeds and associated them with the number of what 17 looks like. And still, in this context, it still seems like a foreign concept and you'll see them saying one, ten, and seven units. And then one day they realize that that is the same as the 17 from the other work that they had done. And making these connections across the math curriculum is, is something that continues to amaze the, the children and, and us as well. Um, because the math curriculum has these two sort of parallel um, ways that, that numbers are represented. One, like you see here, is the decimal system, and the other side is the linear system, um, where we would not skip a thing one unit at a time. And we'll see some of that um, in our... Oh, I moved to your team for that other red chains. Yep. Um, but are we ready to move into the third year, thinking about all of the social preparation, <coughs> emotional preparation, community, and academic that's gone into these two years? Any more questions before we get into remember what the video at the beginning was describing about what happens in that magical third year? questions about that time. All right. So the third year, um, they come in and they've done all this hard work and have such a strong foundation and they're really ready to get into more abstract materials. This is all so concrete. Um, and they're able now to internalize the concepts that they've mastered and give lessons to the younger children too, which is so nice. That's how you really know you've learned something when you can pass along that knowledge. Um, socially, and they're serving as a role model and they're soaring. They're like a, the image of, you know, an airplane, you know, just moving down the runway gaining speed. They're ready just to, to lift off. It's really nice. A lot of times in the third year, the lesson is just this jumping off point. And it's very easy to consider what that might look like in language, right? They learn a phonogram sound, and now they can create their own list that they think of. Or maybe they take something, like they want to write a letter to a family. Whatever it is that they want to express 
they can take the lesson and it's just the jumping off point for their own self-expression. In math, it's interesting to consider how they could use the lesson as a jumping off point. And a lot of times you'll hear children boasting to each other over lunch, you know, math facts. They'll just say to each other, I know what five plus five is and things like this. They're very interested in what they can memorize and know and hold in their head. And a big moment <coughs> in these third years is that realization that a lot of the work they've been proving with the materials is actually going mm -hmm. to live in their head. And when they're doing the bank game again as a third year, they'll want to predict before mm -hmm. they put the golden beads together and then they'll say, I knew that. That's what I, I knew. knew that I knew it was going to be that song. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And the <laughs> estimating that went into the work with the number runs, you're estimating when you're trying to find which one is going to be six or which one's going to be eight. So they're really starting to hold these ideas in their head and memorize them and learn the math facts by heart. And if they're using a material to prove something um, and they want to write it down, I'll have some conversations with them often that will go like this. Um, if you already knew it in your head, then you don't need to write it down. Let's find one that you don't yet know in your head. You can prove that one. You know, so they're not sitting there writing one plus one. Mm -hmm. They really do already know it, and that gives them the idea that they actually will eventually know them all by heart. They choose to. So I would like to do the squaring and cubing lesson. And this is going to be from our linear side of the curriculum. to do the bank game. You really only need to count to 10. You could not know any more numbers and you would be able to be successful with counting 1 to 10 of units, 1 to 10 of tens, 1 to 10 of hundreds, and 1 to 10 of thousands. The linear curriculum is where your rote counting skills come into play. You have to be able to count accurately by rote every number in sequence. Before we can introduce the squaring and cubing materials, we have to do a material called the tens boards, which is an association of quantity and symbol of every number that has two digits. So it's every number from 10 to 99. And there's a golden bead that is associated with every single quantity that's represented by a symbol. So you've got a single 10 bar here, and it says 10. I really wish I had brought this, actually. And a one more unit, you get this symbol card that says 1, and you cover up the 0 of the 10 so that it says 1, 10, and 1 unit, and you see 1, 10, and 1 unit. And then you add one more bead to 11, and it's one more than 11. Get rid of the one more, put a 2. Now it's 12. One more than 12 is, get rid of the 2, put a 3, cover up the 0 with a 3, now it's 13. So you are doing that for every number from 10 to 99. So if you can imagine the length of time that it takes to do and one more, and one more, and one more. And some children are just, oh, I cannot believe this, and some it's like I need to take a break. You know, I mean, it is a very long length, but we're also giving them the impression of the length from 10 to 99. Um, being able to see what the digits look like there and being able to see that the first digit is representing the tens, the second digit representing the units, is really important for them in order to prepare themselves for any of the squaring and cubing work. So just like Emily was describing with the pink tower, or the red rods, holding in your hand a uh, size and length, um, comparing the square of the hundred to the cube of the thousand, you're seeing this again, and we would have this for every number from one to 10. Um, you could make the square of that number, and you can make the cube of that number. So this is just an example of the cube of four, 
and they're having to carry these things across the room, fold them up so that they can compare the square to the chain and see that the chain is exactly the same as four four squares. And then they're taking the four four squares, stacking them together, and comparing that to the cube and proving that yes, in fact, the chain is exactly the same as the cube and that this chain is going to be a linear representation of this cube. I can't count how many beads are in this cube because I can't even see them all. They're all inside there. I, I, couldn't, I can't count that. But if I could open this cube up, then I could count it. So what they actually have to do here is open the cube up, and they're going to be able to count so they can prove to themselves that the cube of four is this number. So then we have the tickets that are going to um, label each bar, each four bar along the cube. So you can imagine what this is like with the cube of eight or nine, it's, or 10, you know, taking over the entire room. A really important skill that they're getting when they do this work, we call skip counting, and it is just basically saying your times tables. You know, first you count every number. One, two, three, four. You're gonna find the card that says four and label it. I can't have a label for every single, you know, first, we even have like these tiny labels that say one, two, three, and four. And I would show them, I just can't manage that. I can't have a label for every single bead. That's too much to manage. We're just going to have the label at the end of each bead bar to keep track. So this one is four. And now I'm going to keep counting. Five, six, seven, eight. Find the label that says eight. Nine, 10, 11, 12. Find the label that says 12. 13, 14, 15, 16. Find the label that says 16. I got to my first square. I counted 16. That's the same as this square here. Now when you're skip counting, there's a work that's just the square first. It's a short chain, the shorter chain. So if I were gonna skip count this, I would say four, eight, 12, 16. The square of four is 16 beads. There are 16 beads in this square. And you're doing your squaring work. Now we're doing the cubing <coughs> work, so you're gonna keep on counting, and you're gonna skip count the whole cube. And then you're gonna be able to compare that four squares of four are the cube of four, and the cube of four is 64. And they're gonna be able to say that and use that language, which is really remarkable. Do some, they go in the hallway, like if it's so this. long. Yeah, I remember yeah. Some, some of the third years in the hallway because it was so long. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then there's skip counting mm -hmm. all the way to 1,000. Questions about this work? Yeah. All right. Any questions about the thing? Um, so another material um, that the children will get to in the third year um, is the stamping, which was in the video. Um, and once they are really successful working with the bank game, and they can write all their numerals and they can exchange, they're going to be introduced to the stamp game, which these are the units, and these are the tens, these are the hundreds, and these are the thousands. And we'll show them how to do addition and do exchanging with the stamp game. And you can see how this is not as concrete. Um, and they'll do um, multiplication with this. And then when they do division, these are their friends that they're sharing with. With the bank game, they have real physical friends, you know, <laughs> where they're sharing out.
count first mm -hmm. the thousands, we, and then the hundreds, <coughs> and then the tens, and the units. But for the stamping, these are these are friends, and they love that. Um, so it progressively gets more and more abstract. Um, I mean, there's materials after this that are more and more abstract that they're practicing the operations. So playing poker at home is appropriate to show them. <laughs> it's their independent work. It's Which just a lot of them to do. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but they will, they will start to get that everything they did with the decimal system work, all four operations can now be represented by this work. And sometimes they'll even be in communication with other children who are doing a banking problem, and I'll say. The same result, and they would be able to see that connection between these materials that this is going to be able to prove actually much faster the same result mm -hmm. because it's a lot faster to not have to get up and walk across the room and go to the real bank and carry over the real concrete materials and feel the real weight. Here, it's just all oh, abstract, yeah. it's just this represents a unit. And this represents a thousand, and they look exactly the same. So a lot of that is really abstract. Oh, and I, um, just to also show just the abstraction. Um, so later, they'll also be just using these charts to solve addition problems. Um, this is a finger chart where they use their fingers to meet and find the sums and multiplication. And then where they have to fill in their own charts, um, or this is a, um, where you have to kind of jump your fingers around and find the product for multiplication. So not using any materials, just a chart. Type. And this is when they really have experienced it, but more they're just kind of checking to see if their knowledge is true. You can see why you would not jump to this mm -hmm. without the real experience first. Mm -hmm. This is more when they're really interested to see if they have memorized it. Mm -hmm. Did we get there? Is it magic? <laughs> so, I had a question earlier talking about how their confidence soars, and, and, and I understand how you know confidence is integral you know, for them to have, but. How do you, how, how can you build that humility as well? Because I feel like confidence worse versus than arrogance. Is. <laughs> I know that's a tipping point, right? Um, there's lots. It's a, the materials themselves, since they're self-correcting, it's like humility is built in, and that making mistakes is okay. I mean, that's why we use glass in the classroom, right? Things break. Okay, you no. Know, well, I know how to clean it up. I know where the dustpan and the brush is. I know where the broom is. I spill water all the time or, you know, make mistakes or bump into things. And, oh, you know, that's okay. I, I know how to fix it. Um, I feel like we don't have arrogant children. They're, just, they're confident, but they're kind. Um, Seems like there's a lot of focus on process too. So instead of maybe being like, oh, I know what the answer is, yeah. it's like, no, you have to slow down and go through the steps and and that that's important. Or and prove it. it. Right. Show me. It. So it's kind of more about maybe the knowing how to do it and do the process than like the, the, the answer. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Great. Go and star in an A plus. Yeah. <laughs> And grace and courtesy, I mean, that's throughout the years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they do say, oh, I'm already past that work, mm -hmm. which I do not like hearing. But I think just by the nature of how our shelves are set up and how they can see the progression of materials and what they were working on before to get to that material, that's just language that they use that they see that I I don't model that, but they, they do that. Do they, they see that? the sequence. They see sure. the sequence. <coughs> when, we, when I say confidence, I'm just talking about the feeling of being capable of doing something. I mean, yeah. that they're working together a lot, too. That seems like it could be another way mm -hmm. to, like, rather than competing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. It maybe does the approach, because they're not all, they're working at different things. Right. They, maybe they're not as competitive. 
Right. right. I mean, even yesterday with Cody, there was a first year boy who came and wanted to watch the bank game. And he's, he first said, You're not ready for this. And I said, <laughs> Cody, remember last year you loved watching the older children do the banking. You just loved it. Right. And I bet, you know, this child feels the same way too. They just can't wait to do it and they want to watch it and they're they're learning and we're all learning. Mm -hmm. So And it's look if you look at what they're doing when they're adding, I mean it's collaborative. Everything they're doing is collaborative. So that is, that's our hope, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good question. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, there's some pictures of 30 years helping uh, younger children and taking care of each other. <laughs> Sophie, she's now in lower elementary, but then with two little first years just watching and all. And here she is. Yeah. Yeah. I love the concentration faces. Mm -hmm. Like all the kids that have the tongue thing. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> and the pride, too. Mm -hmm. Being able to use the button. Mm -hmm. Gotta break some glasses before you could mm -hmm. <laughs> use the blender. These have amazing videos. The Montessori Guide, Montessori Guide website. If you go in there, it will just have videos of the of, uh, work cycle in the classroom. So, uh, like the videos you were showing earlier, I think they're from California, right? Like, I mean, these won't be videos, obviously, from these classrooms, but is it just so universal that pretty much anything we see on any of these, you're most likely doing? It's yeah. universal. But there are, Tamara does videos of our school, yeah. but they're not on social media anymore. How are they accessed? So we have a YouTube channel now that has a lot of videos, especially from last year. And um, we are doing, we have found a way, there's a number of parents who don't want their children to be on social media. So we have a way to blur out faces of those children. So um, our YouTube channel is a good resource for that. And we have some, like for instance, we have the stamp game on there. Um, there's a student working with it independently, so you can see how he goes through that progression and some other specifically children's house resources. I visited um, an old friend of mine who has a nine-year-old in Montessori over there, and she took me to the children's, like took me and Leo to the children's house. It was incredible. It was like the same classroom. <laughs>